Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Predictable Revenue webinar. Um, we've got Jamie Buss here today. She's a VP of sales over at Zendesk for Amer the America region. One of the most popular episodes we've ever had on the podcast. Um, if you haven't had a chance to check it out, Jamie schools us on the her med pick uh, qualification framework. And I know it comes from force management, but really I think the this version of it really came from Jamie. And it's probably it's one of our most uh, listened and watched episodes across all the platforms. So Jamie, thank you so much for coming back. No, I think thank you for having me back. Really excited today because we're talking about something that there there's no school for this. There's no college degree that you can get in sales management. And I think, and so the, the topic today is really, we kind of split it into two. It's on the one hand, it's how do you create and cultivate great uh, sales managers within your organization? And then the second half is once you've got that talent, how do you develop it? How do you, like, what does really great sales management look like? And so that's, that's what we're looking for today. So basically, Jamie, with that being said, want to get into this. So when it comes to developing, and I, I guess, why do we need to focus our attention on cultivating sales talent in, or, in our organizations in the first place? Well, I mean, in terms of cultivating sales talent for leadership or management in particular, um, we obviously we have we have programs for helping people get promoted from SDR, BDR, SMB, commercial into enterprise. But what I really found was a gap was I was about to grow my organization and I knew I was going to need additional leadership. You know, at the time I had a team of about over 130. If I were to look through those 130, you know, I didn't know who was really interested in being a leader. So not only did I not know who was interested, but we hadn't really made any investment in having them explore whether or not leadership was right for them. Um, you know, being a manager is, you have to really like it. It's not just a title increase. You make less money and you get a lot of crap from, you know, your reps and you get a lot of crap from the managers above you. So it's a tough role. You really have to want to sign up for, for the right reasons. And so our thinking was, how do we have people nominate themselves and express interest? And then what's the type of program we could put them in that would give them exposure to the types of things they'd have to do as a leader and as a manager so they could decide. And the goal of the program that we designed was at the end of it, you don't have to go into management. But you should know whether or not that's a career trajectory or a career path that you really want to to actually pursue. And and I love this because this is a program that that you've built and developed within Zendesk. Um, and you, I can't remember if you mentioned it. You, it's called the Rising Stars program, and it's basically an opportunity to test out being a manager and see what that looks like. Yep, absolutely. So what we do, and I can, I'll, I'll share a couple of the slides here if you guys don't mind, um, just because it'll be maybe a little easier for you, you guys to see. Um, what we did is we developed a framework for, you know, people that aren't managers yet. So in the rising star, as we call them, or a new manager. So what are the skills that somebody who's a new manager needs to learn? And then if you're a senior manager, maybe there's less, but I would argue we always could be learning. There's always something that regardless of what level you're at, I think you need to have a growth mindset. So then what, and this, by the way, I partnered with my absolutely fantastic enablement team on this. I could not have done this without them. So I really had like the kernel of the idea and uh, Anna and enablement really create, you know, helped be this become a full formed um, uh, program. And then we focused on, you know, hiring, coaching and managing. And what are the skills that people are going to need in each of those buckets? And then in the Rising Stars program, we decided, well, what's most relevant to someone who's not managing yet? Probably hiring, <clears throat> we can put them on the interview cycle, but they're not going to hire anybody yet because they're still an individual contributor. But, you know, there are areas in here, how, mentoring reps, sharing best practices, tips and tricks. So really kind of taking some leadership roles in meetings. We have programs at Zendesk called Illuminate. We sign them up for that, which is a, um, <clears throat> a more formalized uh mentor uh, coaching group that has more than just salespeople in it. It's across the entire company, <clears throat> excuse me, and then managing. So this is, this is the overall basic framework that we used 
Now, what we didn't want is just anyone to say, I want to be a rising star. That was a bit concerning to me because I'm like, well, I've got a big org and I have people of various degrees of performance. So what's a framework we could use to determine who can actually get into the program? Because, you know, we can't just have our bottom performers signing up for this. So what we did was we came up with a framework that actually became a really good coaching session if it didn't end up that the person ended up in Rising Stars. So we created this knowledge, skills, and qualities framework that we allowed the rep to self-assess and scored themselves on, on each of these. So there's, you know, there's little KSQ assessment form in, in a Google sheet that they'd click on and they'd score themselves and the manager would do the same thing. And then in a meeting, the two would review what the rep's perspe perspective was on their knowledge, qualities, and skills as it relates to their job. And then the manager would as well. And then we look at the overall score between there. And if there were some, you know, if there were some strong gaps between where the manager felt they were and the rep thought they were, then we'd say, you know what, um, I'd love to have you in Rising Stars, but let's put a development plan together to address these particular segments. And then we'll look to put you into the class in the next six month period. So we run this um, every six months. It starts in January and then again in July. Well, in this case, it started July and then went into January. But we're not necessarily saying no, but it gives us an opportunity to help work with that with that individual and fill a particular, particular gap they might have. It could be in the knowledge section, maybe they're losing every time they're competing against Salesforce, or uh, it could be qualities too, right? Maybe um, they don't have a consistent attitude on the sales floor. I mean, when you're a manager, your attitude it amplifies, uh, it affects everyone around you and certainly beneath you. So there could be, you know, qualities areas or that you really need to work on say, listen, like, I'd love for you to be a leader, but I really need to see more consistency in how you behave on the floor. You know, you get really frustrated when you think your quota wasn't fair and um, or the split happened and you really got upset and it was very evident. Um, you have to be able to handle those things with a bit more uh, decorum, if you will. And, and that could be an opportunity to help work with that individual on that before they invest six months in the program um, and, and just gives them a bit of time and, until they're a bit more ready. Because it sounds like it's a pretty in-depth program. And we're going to go a little bit into sort of what does the program look like, what's included. But mm -hmm. you're, you're totally right. Like it, could, it can't just be, a, hey, I raised my hand. I want to get out of this sales role where I'm underperforming and jump in there. Um, right. It, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and at the same time, it's probably also great it, that it's, it's great in the fact that you have all these things documented because I, I found in a lot of sales organizations, you take your best sales rep and they're, and they get promoted to VP of sales, director sales, sales manager. And that's not always the right, the right path for the, for those individuals. It is. It is. And we've, um, we, so we've only around the, this is, we're on the second cycle. So we're in the second six month program, the second class, um, the, out of the first class, I think we ended up hiring, um, two, two new managers going into 2020. And I think some had elected, gosh, I thought I wanted to go into management, but I think I'm actually going to go, um, towards field sales or, um, maybe on the channel team or some other route. So I think it's perfectly fine to determine, that this is not the job for you. It's much easier to determine that when you're in a job you're successful in and can divert to another path than if you go down this path and you're miserable, your team is miserable, and then you need to find a way to move on to something else. So I'm, I'm very clear in the program that once you qualify, you don't have to become a manager, right? You got to really want the job because if you don't really want the job, you're not going to be good at it because it's um, it definitely it has challenges. <laughs> hundred um, percent. Would it be helpful for me to go through a bit of what's um, make up makes up the program? I can definitely do that. I'm going to apologize in advance because the slide is a little bit of an eye chart. It's not necessarily meant for um, a live webinar audience, but it does help me um, walk you through a bit of what we include. So a lot of it has to do with um, teaching them a concept and then having them apply the concept. So there are components of web-based training that they'll go through and it might be on how to conduct a 101 or how to, to keep organized, um, 
how to communicate clearly. There's all the different um, online uh, tools that we have them use. But then it, we also do coaching circles where they will bring an issue or in those circles are existing managers and they will share issues that they've had. Of course, not in a way that's going to disclose anything that should not be disclosed, but maybe a personal challenge they had when they first came into management. Um, you know, I often tell the story of, you know, when I first came into manager, I was not a good one. Um, I think managers come in either um, way too nice or way too strict and not nice. And I kind of came in on the not nice end of the spectrum. And I think it, you really have to find how do you create that balance and recognize if you have fallen into one of those into one of those traps. So by allowing the other, you know, bringing the managers and the potential leaders together, that helps. And then we have them do things like run a team meeting. So they get to run the forecast or they get to run the uh, the, the team meeting where they're sharing a best practice. And we've gotten some excellent best practices that we've been able to use across the organization from our potential leaders um, engaging in this. Um, we also have them coach a middle of the pack rep. We're very careful to have the manager, the actual manager of the rep pick this person because it can't be someone who's underperforming because obviously that is not something you want to give to someone who's not yet a manager. But how would you work with the rep and coach them on forecasting um, accurately? As you guys know, that's important to me. We had the other, uh, the other talk was about that topic. Um, but it gives them an opportunity to, um, you know, give somebody advice and, and coaching is tough. Telling, how, telling people how to do something is easy, but coaching is not easy. And so we really try to give them practice on asking really good questions to get people to lead themselves to an answer, which also helps us in selling cycles anyway, because you want to use questions um, to lead the sales cycle more than you want to be telling your customer things. So it actually has a little bit of a, a double benefit there. Um, we also noticed that people in this program were naturally stepping up a bit more on the floor. So whether or not, sh you know, sharing their best practice or, you know, leaning in and getting something done that maybe the rest of the team is, you know, sometimes you just got to, you got to tackle a task. You got to, you know, book executive meetings for your upcoming conference. And maybe you feel like it's diverting you a bit from your day-to-day -day job, but you know, at the end of the day, that, that will help you drive more business. Our rising stars are the ones who are getting out in front, hitting the phones, getting that booked, and then moving on to something else and, and really setting a great example. So I shared that with a lot of the global leaders because we were the first region to deploy this program. And I shared a lot of these ancillary benefits with the other regions. And I think we're at the point where the other regions are looking to roll this out as well. Um, because not only did they groom leaders, but it actually helped kind of raise the overall performance and um, you know, positive attitude and leadership on the sales floor, because you end up with you know, 10, 12 people in this program. That's 10, 12 people that are really trying to step up and um, uh, demonstrate demonstrate leadership and that just kind of raises up the quality of your whole team and even if these people like exactly what you said even if these people aren't making or decide not to go into management roles they still have all this phenomenal experience so there there have to be so many knock-on benefits beyond just cultivating you know new leaders within the team yeah, there are. I mean, if you think about it, if these qualities that you're learning in here help you if you're in a sales cycle as well, right? You kind of have to lead the sale. You have to lead the opportunity and help and help be a leader in that in that scenario with the customer. Good listening, asking good questions, maintaining a good attitude. All of those things translate as into into sales. So, for example, when we have people do coaching circles, we actually train our man, our active managers on this. Then what we do is when we do a med pick session, we have them use the skills that they learned in the coaching circle when they're doing a med pick. And then we have them report back, how did they find that experience? And oftentimes we'll get, well, you know, I caught myself telling them to do X, Y, or Z, but I caught it. And then the next time I made sure I was asking questions and drawing that out, letting them come to the conclusion rather than me just telling them what to do. So, you know, kind of that instruct and then actually do the activity and then report back has been a good way, I think, of instilling the learning, um, both into active managers as well as potential leaders. 
Gotcha. And so it's sort of like that three phase of here's, here's what you here's what we want you to, um, want you to try and coach somebody on here's your opportunity to actually go do it live. And then you're going to circle back with us on how did that go? What is, mm-hmm. And then I, I'm assuming they're, they're paired up with one individual that they're coaching for the, for the period or like for that time period. Yes, that's, I forgot about that part. That is an excellent question. So the limiting factor of our Rising Stars program is the number of mentors that we have available. So we look at ex- how experienced the managers are, and we want them to have at least a year under their belt of, of being a manager themselves, and then they can um, qualify and, and be a mentor. If there's a manager who maybe we're having you know, challenges with themselves. And obviously we're not going to put them into the mentor program, but um, we basically, we, we have a one-to-one relationship. So they have one-on-ones with that person in addition to the coaching circles, which are more a many to many type of environment, but the mentor um, is individually the one who they're reporting back to when they're doing a coaching circle or um, getting feedback from when they run a team meeting or feedback from when they're coaching the rep. So it's it's nice because it's not their own manager. So it's somebody who is a little bit, you know, not working with them on a day-to-day basis as a rep. And that dynamic has worked really well for us. But I would say that that ends up being the limiting factor of at least this version of the program is that you have to have enough mentors to support the amount of members that are are in the program. Gotcha. And so the, it is that one-to-one mapping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Um, we, we, you've brought it up a couple of times and I, I know you talked about it a little bit earlier, but I'd love to just double click on the sort of idea of the coaching circles. Can you walk us through like what, what it feel, what it would be like to, like, what are we trying to accomplish in these sessions and, and how do you structure or organize those sessions? So I usually will have, um, because I have such a great partnership with enablement, they will either solicit questions from the team beforehand on topics that they're not sure how to answer. So um, let's say that they're really nervous about having a difficult conversation or providing feedback. Then that might be a scenario where they'll prep the um, man, the current managers that are in there and have them come prepared with, hey, have you ever found this difficult or how have you navigated a situation like this in the past? Um, when they're active managers, it's a little different. Then it's the, the manager, we have at least three people in a pod. You've got a person who has the, who's asking the question has the problem. You've got the manager who's trying to coach and then you have an observer. And you, you usually spend two minutes on that topic and whatever, in, in, you can either pick that topic beforehand or somebody can pick it and say, um, um, I'm having a difficulty with, um, a customer who is doing X, Y, Z, or I'm having difficulty with a rep who is consistently coming in late, even though I've had multiple conversations, or there's a lot of gray area conversations that have, that can happen as a manager. So then what happens is the person who has the issue will present the issue. Hey, how do I handle this with this rep? And then the coach is supposed to ask a lot of questions, um, to get the, um, well, what had an example of what a coach might say is, um, what have you tried so far? And how did that work? What do you think could have worked better? Um, is there a different way you could have said that? Um, what is the outcome that you're hoping to obtain? So the goal is not to say, well, of course your rep can't come in late every day. You just got to tell them they need to come in or they're fired. Like that's, that's not the idea of a coaching circle, right? The idea is to get them really to think through um, and I, I do have a separate slide on this. It's just not on this deck, unfortunately. Um, but um, it's basically trying to walk them through um, what's the scenario, what have you tried, what could, what's the outcome you want, and what could you try different. And it's, it's really, you could really apply that to pretty much anything, to be honest. So that's really the framework of it. Three person, those are the three roles. You got two minutes, you work through it. And then the observer will give feedback because sometimes when you're the coach, you end up telling people what to do and you don't really realize it because it's just a habit that most of us are in. So the observer is there to say, hey, that was really great when you did this, but noted here, we could maybe, we could have asked this question instead of telling them what to do. Does that help? Gotcha. Totally, totally. And 
and just so I can get my head straight, it's, is it the, is a coaching circle just a pod of three individuals or is the, are there more people within that? Like, is there, are there multiple pods within this one coaching circle? So what we'll do is let's say there's a room of 12 people, then there'll be a um, 15 minute overview on how coaching circles work. We usually bring um, our HR business per partner. She's, you know, she, she'll come in and instruct. And then the rest of the time, that we will break up into groups of three and those groups of three will go through um, the different topics and then we'll come together for the last 15 minutes and really talk about what did you find easy what did you find really hard um now how are you going to go and apply this what's a scenario where you can apply this into real life and then i want you to give us feedback on how that goes after after you give it a try so it's really kind of the same framework of instruct try go try in the wild and then report back how it goes I'm taking notes, I think selfishly, so I can keep on track with the, where we're at, but also I'm like, I need to be doing this myself. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious, the, um, you said you, you have HR come in and give the like 15 minutes on how the coaching circles work. Any, anything that, that they would, that your, your business partner there would cover um, that we haven't talked about or any, any ideas? Um, yeah, I had covered that you might want to, if somebody's trying to replicate this after this, uh, this episode, um, anything we've missed so far? Um, you know what? I've, off the top of my head, I don't think I have that exact slide accessible at the moment. Um, afterwards, though, I'm happy to go look that up and send that up, send that as a follow up on coaching circles. If there is something in there that I didn't mention, like I think that it's a kind of three step outline. I'd be happy to send that as a follow up in case other people would like to try to use this this uh, process. Awesome. Yeah. Sorry. I'm, I know I'm catching you off, off guard here. We had kind of a structured piece, but I'm like, Oh, I just saw the opportunity that we really have to dive into this. No, you know what? It's a great point. I just, um, I, do, I just don't have that in here, but, uh, I should. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Okay. So if we go back, so I'd love, uh, thanks for jumping in on the coaching circles. I, I appreciate taking the, the left turn with us. Mm -hmm. Um, and so let's come back to rising stars program. And so really it's, we've got the mentor, we've got the coach, we have somebody that the mentor is, we got somebody that's sort of mid pack that they're coaching. Um, I'm curious, like what are, yeah, I guess what are the, what are the core skills that you're trying to develop in the, like maybe we can d dive a little bit deeper into the core skills you're trying to develop in that program. Um, sure. I definitely will cover that, the core skills. I also see a question in here that people are asking about how do you do coaching circles with remote teams? Um, and we absolutely oh, do that. One of my requirements for this program when I was first conceptualizing it with Anna was we have to be able to include my whole org. And that means the people who are remote because I have people that are field reps that want to be managers as well. And they should not be left out of this just because they're not in one of our, you know, three core offices for the commercial team. So we do do co coaching circles remotely and we've worked it out. So what they do is they'll break off into, they'll be assigned and they'll break off into separate Zoom rooms. Those th groups of three will break off into one Zoom room. They'll do that. And then at the and then when they come back at the end, so they basically start off in one Zoom room, they break off into their pod Zoom, and then they come back into the core one and finish off the meeting. And that has worked just fine. Um, I, we got great feedback from our remote employees. Uh, I think that was one of my challenges, which if we, when we get to the other deck, one of my challenges was really keeping the field engaged because the farther you get from HQ or one of the core offices, the harder it is to stay connected to everything. And I, I definitely did not want my field team to feel that they were not a part or included or that I wanted to make an investment in them as well. So that was a core requirement. Um, it was, it, it actually worked out quite well. And then any other instruction that we do, we make sure that there's a zoom on it. So some people might be in the room, some people might be zoomed in, but we make sure that the remote teams are always included. Um, so some of the core skills that we uh, are, we're trying to expose them to or develop is, you know, what are the challenges? Understand the challenges that you're going to face and what your responsibility is as a manager. You're going to have to provide feedback. How are you going to do that? Um, you're going to have to help them forecast. So you better be good at it, first of all. And then how are you going to um, uh, help them forecast? Because it's one thing to do it yourself, another to train somebody else. And then 
you need to be a good communicator. You need to be able to identify and share best practices in a scalable way. Right? Your job is to really look for who's doing something really well and then replicate that across the team. And that's why an element is presenting one of those, you know, basically creating the deck and presenting uh, the, one of your best practices that you want to share with the team. So, and it's also to expose them to, you know, I, I actually do in the, in the deck that when we get to the, um, the next section, I actually spend an hour and a half with the rising stars going through my expectations on leadership and why it matters. And I share a lot of my war stories along the way so that they know what they're signing up for. Part of it too is that opt in, opt out. So it's not just the skills I want you to learn, but it's exposure to what you're going to have to do so you can make a decision as to whether or not that's right for you before you sign up to officially do the job. Gotcha. And, and throughout the program, when you, I've heard you mention a couple of times that you have, um, you have developed something new. So they're bringing an improvement. Is this to the Rising Stars program? Is this to the sales, to their sales playbook, to part of the sales program? Um, so what did we do with the last one? I think what we did is we had them share it in a team meeting and then it was so well received that we also included it in a global sales and success webinar that we hold every Monday morning. There's different topics that the sales and success team are trained on. So they actually did, and that was great because it, it demonstrated their leadership globally, not just to their own team. It gave them a chance to kind of warm up and find out what some of the questions might be from their own team, a little bit more of a safe space, and then and then share that globally with the team as well. So we kind of got a, a little bit of, um, of both uh, aspects there of an in-person where you might be asked more questions and then more in a webinar type of environment where you're instructing a little harder to answer questions because the sales team is quite large at this point, but at least you do get an opportunity to present to a large audience. So um, we kind of, we kind of did both. Gotcha. That's, that's great. Um, and so if, if I'm looking at sort of a recap of the rising stars program, it's, it opt in it's, it's an opportunity for, a potential future sales leader try out the role. It's not a. It's not them taking them out of their their full time role. They're still individual contributor, and then this is just something that they're doing on the side. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go into a management role, um, but it does mean that throughout you're going to be developing some of these leadership skills to give you a taste of what it's like. And I love that you're doing role plays. I love this sort of, you know, instruction. All right, try it, try it live. Now come back. Let's get some, get some feedback. I think this is, this is something incredible that you're doing that it certainly is leveling up a huge number of salespeople. And I think uh, the world's going to thank you for that. Cause even if they don't, you know, go on to be managers at Zendesk, you're, you're creating a, a huge number of very talented salespeople and sales leaders. Um, just that, uh, that's going to help everybody. Um, and so, the goal is obviously to create sales leader or to, to help the right people make it into the into your sales leadership program. Um, what else? What else have we have we missed before we jump from rising stars to like how to be a great manager? Um, I, I think you really captured the um, core elements of the program, the goal of the program, and you know some of the more details of of what we do to to execute that. So I don't I don't think you're missing anything. I think you did a nice summary. Um, of rising Perfect. stars. I, but, uh, there's one thing I did that I wanted to ask at the beginning that I, I sort of left um, before. And so before we transition, um, I know part of the, um, I, and I'm not sure if it's part of the, you know, the application process or part of, you know, once you're accepted into the program, um, but you mentioned the true tilt profile. So can you tell me about that and how you use it? Um, yes. So I wish I had all of those memorized. Um, all right. So there, and I can, you know what, I will take this as another follow-up because I will send you guys the link to this, but this is an awesome, it's like one of those personality assessment things. You know, if you've ever done Myers-Briggs, there's a million of these types of things out there, but we actually brought in a coach to teach us about these personality profiles and it was so, it was amazing to be able to understand. It actually helped me understand people and myself a lot better. Um, so for example, um, 
you know, there's different personality types. There's the, the quiet genius, there's mastermind. Um, I can't remember all the other ones off the top of my head, but there's there's different profiles that you fall into based. And it's amazing, you guys. Literally, you, an, you answer these questions and you're like, there's no way they're going to come up with my personality type based on this. And you'll be so shocked. I think it's like $45, though. I mean, it's not, it's not for free, but it's worth, worth the investment, in my opinion. Because so what it does is it t- teaches you what type of personality type you have and what type of personality type your direct report or someone else might have and how to interact with that. For example, you know, I'm mastermind, which means I'm like very processed, very detail oriented. And, you know, the monkey's still on my back unless you've told me, yes, I hear you and I'm going to take care of it. So it, when I get stressed, I can end up being a micromanager because I feel like all the monkeys are on my back. But that's important for me to recognize and for me to share with my direct reports that like, hey, if I have something, something's due tomorrow, all I want is like a thumbs up on Slack so you guys know uh, you recognize that it needs to get done. Otherwise, I feel like that monkey is still on my back, <laughs> right? That ball is still in my court and I still need to make sure it gets done. So that's an important thing is otherwise you're direct, you know, I don't, I don't want to micromanage people, but I, ha- but my psychology, I have to know at least it's being worked on so I can let it go. And that's an important thing to be self-aware of. Um, you know, one of the other profiles, the quite the, um, um, cross pollinator, that one is really tough for me because Cross pollinators have a tough time making a decision. They like to collaborate. They like to ask a lot of questions. They like to make sure they're making the right call. Um, they don't get things done on time. And that clashes with my personality type. So it's good to know because mm-hmm. cross pollinators can be very good at garnering um, uh, garnering con- consensus amongst people. Whereas maybe I make a decision too quick. A cross pollinator would do a lot better job of gathering that information before they make a call. So there's all these kinds of strength and weaknesses assigned with both. Um, but yeah, it's called the true tilt profile. And I think it's $45. I'll send you guys the link to what we do um, after this. And I'll see if I've got like a one pager or something on the profiles. I can't remember if I have that, but we do do that because I want the whole leadership team to be self-aware of, you know, how do they tend to operate and what are the strengths and challenges associated with that so that they can um, just, you know, be self-aware with themselves and others. And I think I, we've found it to be super helpful. And I, I think I, I really like, we've done strengths finders here. I've done the Myers Briggs assessments. The, the interesting piece for me was it creates it's it it was almost a it was almost a similar m- mental shift as when you sort of taught me about medic or medpick um that you don't realize that there are different different people i think the, the one of the hardest ideas as a as a new manager for me was to understand that i am not a representative sample of everybody and what i would appreciate in terms of feedback in terms of being treated as a as a mentor or an employee or a team uh, team player um is not the way that everybody else wants to be treated and in fact pe- some people are a certain way they like to be communicated with a certain way and i think as a manager understanding that understanding the people like your preferences and under and realizing that other people might have different preferences and that's okay and it's sort of like you know if you're in a relationship it's almost like reading the five love languages right it just helps you understand the other side of the equation or in in maybe in my case that there is another side of the equation and that not everybody is exactly like me and thinks exactly like me and so to me i love these um these types of profiles they're you know they're never going to be a thousand percent accurate um but i've been surprised every like the ones that i've taken the true tilt the strengths finder the myers-briggs like did they talk to my mom? Like, how did they know all this about me? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I feel the same way. I was shocked because the questions didn't, they seemed a little random to me. So I'm like, how is this going to correlate into a profile? But then I read it and I was like, oh my God, that's so me. (laughs) So I was really impressed by it. Now I I see one of the questions that says culture index, that one of the, um, someone in the audience is using culture index for a basis of strength and profile understanding. I have to admit, I'm not familiar with that. So I don't know um, if it would supersede. My guess would be it's complementary versus necessarily supersede. This is more, um, this is more of like, how do you interact in business? It's more of your, 
True Tilt is really about your business persona. What is your um, character at work? How, what is your work profile? It really kind of focuses on that, whereas Myers-Briggs can go in a lot more of this is how you are as a parent. This is how you would be as this. True Tilt really focuses on your work character, if that makes sense. So it's a little more specific, gotcha. I think, in term, in, 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 as opposed to um, maybe I'm not familiar with Culture Index, so I'm not I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but yeah, yes, I, I, I can't say familiar either. <laughs> yeah, and one Jacob, if you're thinking about you know how to how would these live side by side? There's a great by, book by Ray Dalio, um, and he it, principles, and he talks about how they actually create baseball cards for their team members, and instead of of just having you know one Myers Briggs type, they have I think they have like six or eight different profile surveys or different of uh, their people take you know six to eight of these profiles, and they get and you get this like really detailed baseball card. It's a, like what's the best way to you know it combines the both combines all of them it takes the best from each piece and sort of brings them all together. So if you're thinking about oh how do I bring these together, um, Ray Dalio's principles has a really great um, section. I think he yeah um, on that idea. And so Jamie, I want to want to turn this back to you. You know now that we've talked about how do we identify sort of those rising stars in the organization, how do we give people a better chance at becoming a great manager? What is like, how do you become once you've got the job? How do you become somebody that people want to work for? Yeah, no, that is that's an excellent question. I actually started talking on this topic uh, several years ago. I was at uh, A16Z at the time, and I recognized that when, when, and I think this is true in all disciplines, I don't think it's just sales, but sales is my trade, so that's what I focused on. But when people are good individual contributors, they're not trained to be managers. It happened to me, I'm sure it happened to most of you guys, is that you're a top performing rep and you decide, you know what, I, you know, I've, in my case, I was captain of the volleyball team in high school. I led all the projects in college because I wanted to get it done and I just didn't trust anyone else was gonna get it done. Um, you know, I tended to just kind of step into that type of position and I wanted to get into management, but I got into it and I didn't know what I was doing. Like I, it, and I realized, you know what, this is a completely different discipline. And I had to study a lot. I've read so many books. I've dug through HBR endlessly. Actually, I just was recently going through because we we're finding some case studies that we wanted to add to our Rising Stars program. We thought case studies might be a nice addition. Um, so I was peeling through and taking some of the newer ones. But I really spent a lot of time why do people want to work for people? Because I'd had good bosses, I've had not as good bosses. What made bosses good? What made them not good? And how do we get people thinking about this a bit more so that when they are a boss, they're better bosses and people want to work for them? That was really my main goal behind this. And you know, I was asked the other day, what's the difference between um, you know, a, a, a team that can get to 10 million or 100 million or a billion um, on, on the go-to-market side. And I said, you know, other than, of course, product market fit, because <laughs> that's step number <laughs> one. <laughs> but assuming you have really solid product market fit across a lot of markets, not just SMB, but, you know, enterprise as well, assuming you have that, I think the next thing is your management team. Your second line, your front line, second line, third line. Do your leaders treat leadership as a separate discipline or are they just managing the deals? And I really, really think that's the difference. I would even say to you guys, if you go into a Starbucks or a Pete's or a Dunkin' Donuts, whatever, go into any type of store. And if it's well run, um, they, get, they get your order right, they get it in a timely manner, they get your name right, it's clean, it's well run. I guarantee you that store manager has a pride in their work, right? And they wanna run that store well. And then you've gone into other stores where, um, the line is forever, the cashier is taking a long time, it's dirty, there's spilled coffee everywhere. That store manager doesn't have pride in their work. I really truly believe that no matter what you're doing, the managers can have a very positive impact on how that team performs. And because I felt so strongly about this, I've you know kind of created content around that. And I was I was gonna walk you guys through some of the things that that I've done and that I've 
um, you know, tried and experimented on my own team so you guys can kind of think about, um, think about some of that. And to kind of hit that point home, um, you know, one thing I remind people of is, you know, it costs a lot to replace your employees. You know, the average is six to nine months of their salary to train a replacement. So losing a good employee is painful. I never want to lose someone to going to another organization for a flat role. Now, let's say someone wants to go to a, wants a director position and I don't have it. They've been with us for a few years. I don't have line of sight to give them that director role. Um, if they find a great director position somewhere else, that's great. But if they just move flat to go somewhere else, that's not good. That means we've probably done something wrong. Um, and, and the number one reason, and I'm sure some of, I, I'm sure some people in the audience have experienced this. Um, you know, people leave their managers, not their jobs. I mean, that that's the number one reason over mil, one million people pulled by Gallup. So we don't want to be the managers that people leave. I try very, very hard to be the manager that people want to work for. I want them to be loyal. I want to, I have their backs. I want them to be supported. I'm also really clear about my expectations so that if I do need to have a coaching conversation, you know, we can do that. And if you do lose your people, you're at, you're at your ex, you're definitely going to affect your retention, which is going to impact your revenue. And you're going to be stuck doing a, a ton of recruiting. So in a nutshell, that's kind of the problems I was seeing and why I decided to invest um, in presenting this. I mean, I present this to startups a lot of the times so of founders, even though it's more of a, it has some sales bent to it because I think everyone could have a little bit more um, education and thinking about and treating leadership and management as a separate discipline. I, I can say this is in, especially in the early days. And I know my experience is fairly small and sort of like cute compared to like Jamie's managing thousands of salespeople. Um, but in the early days of predictable revenue, when we weren't intentional about our recruiting and, and our retention, um, not that we had bad people, we just had good people that were in the wrong roles at the wrong company sometimes. And we, you know, there were a couple things that really influenced us. Um, we had some really strong mentors. Once we, once we got our recruiting on board, once we, like, once we had a really strong process for recruiting the right people, once we were confident in who, who did we actually want, and we were really strong on you know, giving them a great place to work, our customer retention doubled. Right. Oh, in like in a six month period. And you'd say we got better at, you know, certain product pieces. Um, but I'd say it's ma the majority of it was we had happier people. Um, they were staying longer. Our employee retention uh, over. Well, it was it went from sort of an average of like six months to 18 months in a you know, over that time period. And so for us, even a, as a very small organization, this had a massive impact both on the organization health in terms of people enjoying their jobs, um, customers enjoying to working with us, and that had a direct effect on revenue. Yeah, I know, Colin, I think that's a, a great example um, on how it actually impacted your business as well. Um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to date. I haven't had um, a ton of attrition out of my organization, but I would imagine, you know, every time if you're in sales, every time you change hands with accounts, that's a risk because customers, it's very annoying for customers to have to change account ownership. Now, of course, you're going to have to do that when you grow, you're going to have to make changes, but it interjects r risk into the system every time an account changes hands. So if you have a rep managing 100 accounts, that's a hundred accounts that are at risk if you end up losing that rep. So it absolutely has a direct impact on you driving the business. Um, in addition to um, the cost of replacing them, it could also mean cost to the business as well. So I think that that's an excellent point. For sure. Cause you're also like, if you think about how long does it take to, for a, a new rep to ramp to productivity in a territory, even if they haven't established, you know, a hundred accounts, there, it, it certainly isn't an overnight thing. You can't just plug and play somebody brand new and expect them to hit the quite out of the gate. This is something that's going to take time. Yeah, no, exactly. So one of the questions I get is, okay, great. Well, right now I can measure my team based on performance against quota and us being in sales, our performance is very evident for everyone to see. There's really no hiding what percentage you're at when you're in sales, but there's this underlying, how do you know if people are actually engaged 
right? And that's what I was worried about is how do I, how do I gauge the health outside of quota attainment? Because you could have some insidious things hiding underneath there. And if you end up with a quarter that looks like this, right? And you haven't flushed out that you have an engagement problem, then you're going to have, you know, people overboard, your ship's going under, you're going to be in really bad shape. So I'm like, how do I do this where I can really get a true pulse on how things are going? So I don't know if any of you guys have ever read First Break All the Rules. Um, it's now published by Gallup Press. It used to be Mark Buckingham because I'm old and I read it when it wasn't Gallup, but <laughs> um, it was originally, it is now published by Gallup. I have read so, so many management books, and I have to tell you guys, this is still my favorite. I think there's principles in it that whenever I present this deck to my team, it reminds me of things that I slip up on or I forget. Now, there, what this book encourages is that there's 12 basic questions that you can ask a team and you know gauge them on a scale of one to five, how strongly they feel these things. So if I know it's expected of me at work, if my manager's really good at communicating this and I know, I know what I'm supposed to do and I'm very organized about it, I'm probably gonna put a five because I don't feel anxious about that. I don't feel like I've just been left to my own devices to figure things out um, completely on my own. Um, people know, need to know what's expected for them to be held accountable for that. So I can go through some, some examples of these, um, but the, the idea is that you have a survey that you send to the team with a score of one to five, and it has to be anonymous. So when I did do this with my team, I, my poor team had to be my guinea pigs on this, but I actually think we got some really good outcomes from it. Um, enablement, again, part me, partnered with me to make sure that this happened, but we sent out an anonymous survey, so we didn't know who answered what. Um, we had, you could, add, you could actually put a comment at the bottom, so any kind of comments people wanted to make, and we did not share the comments directly with any of the managers, because what we found is our company does a pulse score, but they share the comments with the managers, and unfortunately, sometimes the managers could decipher who said what, and that was actually causing some problems for us. People were reluctant to put what they really thought because they were concerned their manager would be able to reverse engineer that it was them. So we made this truly anonymous. You could still add comments, but then what Enablement and I did was we would anonymize and just turn the comments into themes. So each manager would receive a theme of their, com of their comments uh, versus the actual comment itself. And because the reps knew we were gonna do that, they were very honest with us and we were able to identify issues within our own leadership team that we didn't know we had. One of those things was we actually looked at engagement score because you, if you're scoring them one to five, you can actually come up with an engagement score. There's a whole methodology for this online if you guys look up first break all the rules and engagement survey on Gallup. I think they, they give you a nice framework for this. Um, but you, once you look at the score, we actually noticed that the engagement score at you know our San Francisco office was a little higher than Madison, which was higher than New York, and then the remote employees were the lowest engaged out of everyone. So that was definitely a problem. So we weren't doing a good job with our um, remote employees. Hence, my Rising Stars program had a distinct uh, application for remote employees. And in addition to the, the engagement by location, um, roles, it was also similar. So the more junior roles were more engaged than the more senior roles. And thirdly, across all the roles, reps did not feel that they were getting recognition. So we we really and and they felt that the, their manager did not know or understand their career path. So if you look at some of these questions, you can see how we got that right. So at work, do I have the opportunity to do I best what do best every day? In the last seven days, have I received recognition or praise for doing good work? We got a very low score on that, so we were not doing a good job at that. We got a moderate score on care about me as a person, and for those that managers that got a lower score in this, I recommended that they. Um, Pick up radical candor, listen to it on their commute in, on their commute home. That's what I did. Um, I think that really helped some of my leaders 
learn how to phrase difficult feedback and connect with people first and have those conversations in a more candid way. So radical candor definitely helped us with question number five. Um, did someone encourage my development? We didn't score well on that. We didn't score well that my opinions seemed to count. So when we started to look at this stuff, we're like, gosh, we thought we were doing really good at recognition. It turns out we weren't. We thought, I thought my frontline managers were really understanding the career path for each of their reps. That didn't turn out to be true. So in the, over the course of the next six months, we really made a concerted effort. And in fact, my, my org was the only org that made a specific investment in trying to correct some of these things. We were the only org in the formal pulse score that the company did. We were the only one who had our score go up. <laughs> and I think it's because we really made a concerted effort to address the things that we had flushed out were problems. Now, one thing I would tell you guys, if you do use the survey, on question 10, where it says, do I have a best friend at work? I would recommend changing the phrasing of that one. People take it literally, and that's not really what it means. It means, do you have somebody that you trust and can confide in at work? Because when I said best friend, people were thinking, oh, well, well, that's not my best friend. Like, I'm not, you know, they're thinking, the best man or, or, you know, maid of honor at their wedding. And that's not what it means. It means, do you have somebody at a peer level that you can confide in? And that that's, and when we changed the question the second time, the score shot way up. So that score was super low and almost became meaningless because it just was misinterpreted. So if you guys do do this, I would just say, just put, do you have someone you trust and can confide in at work? Cause that's more important. If people don't feel that they have someone they can connect to, they're much more likely to leave, right? And that doesn't mean we need to all hire a bunch of automatons who are all exactly the same, but you need to make sure, you know, if people feel very isolated, you spend so much time at your work and humans are naturally more community oriented, especially those of us, a lot of us that end up in sales. So if you feel completely disconnected from the community, you're probably more loose in the saddle than someone who, who is super connected. So I'm um, calling any, any kind of questions on, on some, on some of the survey that we did before we, we move on. Um, the biggest question I had was the, was around the work best friend. Um, cause I, I think there was, we, we've run a similar survey and ran into similar, um, we've got something that automatically pings our people on Slack. Um, I, I think I like the fact that you're anonymizing it and then having sort of two people that aren't maybe the direct boss, um, look at the comments and then generalizing those. Um, I'll just double click on that. We, we didn't, we found the exact same thing with, uh, our early attempts to survey the team. Um, and it wasn't until we had somebody, we actually had one of our mentors um, look at all the results in a non, like, and basically summarize them. So it wasn't the management, the senior management team being able to reverse engineer it. Cause we're a small enough team where, you, you know, somebody says this, you're like, oh, I remember, you know, so-and-so mentioned this or mentioned that. And so I, I just wanted to highlight that. I think that's a, a really great thing that to have the, have the ability to comment, but also have somebody sort of external from that manager employee relationship um, that's summarizing it so that there is more ability to reverse engineer. Right. Yeah. I think that taking that reverse engineering ability out is really where you get the real answers. And this was super important for me. Um, we had to make, you know, we, we definitely made some decisions differently uh, based on the results of this. So Viet I see you've got a question on how to apply this framework when hiring sales managers um, and what are some key elements that might translate. So whenever I'm hiring a leader into my org, I am asking questions to try to vet, to try to understand if that person treats management and leadership as its own discipline or not. So one of the things you might ask is, um, you know, how do you handle what what? How do you typically handle one on ones? Don't give them much more data than that. Like you don't you don't need to lead the witness, but. You know, if they're giving you answers of like, well, you know, I really dig into the deals. I make sure I understand what's going on, the, on, on in the deals. Or, um, you know, I try to have the one-on-ones, but I'm in the field all the time. So it's really hard. So we're mostly just talking about the opportunities um, where I make sure I'm passing down information. 
that to me would be a bit of a red flag as opposed to someone who's like, listen, I know one-on-ones are important. And I understand that, you know, people have of all levels have uh, goals and objectives they're trying to meet in their career. And I need to, you know, I try to make sure that I'm, um, you know, connecting with my, with my team and have the trust. I know them as people because I know when push comes to shove and I'm gonna have to ask them to do something difficult that I need to I need to know what motivates them. I, I need to understand where they're coming from as a person. And, you know, that that's going to come down to spending that, you know, some, spending that time with them to really understand that. So I think there's different questions you can ask, or I'll ask a very open-ended question of, um, you know, if I were to ask one of your, you know, current direct reports, how what kind of manager would they say you are? And that gives people the opportunity. Like if someone were to ask me that, I'd launch into, well, here's my thoughts on, on leadership and management. And usually if people don't launch into some specifics, then that is not a good habit. For, that is not a habit for them. That is not something they do regularly. So that's actually a tip that's in First Break All the Rules. How do you interview people? And looking for specifics and specificity in the interview answers is a way to determine if that's something that people do regularly. If it's very high level in general, it's probably not a habit. So I don't know if that answered the question, but that's one way that I've gone about it. Perfect. Great questions, Viet. Thanks so, thanks for uh, for chiming in there. Um, so I, I'd love to, because I, I do want to leave some room at the end. I, I do want to follow up on the on the medic or med pick um, and see how you've been going or see how that's been going for you. Um, and so maybe this is a, a great place to transition because we're talking about one on ones and mm -hmm. and part of the part of the management process is that sort of performance management. You know, when you have somebody who's, um, you know, when you have somebody who's killing it. You know, removing the barriers. When you have somebody who's sort of, sort of middle of the road, painting that path to here's how you, um, here's how you can be better. If you've got somebody who's maybe below middle middle of the path, you know, finding ways to either get them up to you know an acceptable level or find them a new place. Um, and, mm -hmm. and you sort of said it in our pre and in, in the you know before we jumped into recording here that it can really if you're not being intentional about you know who you're who you're making who you're moving on from the organization it can really drag down the whole team so i'd love right, to understand right. what is your yeah what are your thoughts on performance management and then help me understand like what it looks like what good performance sure. management looks like yeah absolutely so i think it kind of goes back to you know kind of those initial questions if you um uh, one of them is you know do i know what's expected of me at work that is the first question of, of first break all the rules. And that needs to be really clear at the get go so that people understand what good looks like. If you don't know what good looks like, you don't know what you're aiming for. So that's on the manager. What does good look like? And then it's on the manager to provide feedback on how they're doing against those expectations and holding the reps uh, or holding their direct reports accountable for what those expectations are. So as long as everyone's really clear, you know, like if it's activities, if it's pipe gen, if it's closed business, if it's new business, expansion business, whatever the material outcomes you're expecting, you know, activities and outcomes you're expecting of your team, it should just be really clear and it should be fair and equitable for everyone. Because if you do have to end up performance managing, you don't want to get into the, it's not fair. <laughs> um, like, no, no, these mm -hmm. expectations are the same for everybody. So I think in terms of your top performers, you don't want to ignore them. You definitely want to invest time there. And I think that key is understanding where do they want to go in their career? Do they want to be an IC? Are they, you know, we have people here. There's like rock stars and rising stars, right? I know Kim, St Kim Scott talks about that, a radical candor. Rock stars and rising stars. It's fine to be a rock star. That means you love your job. You're a rep. You're a top performing rep. You make a lot of money and you have no intention on taking on the burden of management. That is perfectly fine. There's a lot of people who make a lot of money by choosing that career path, and that's the right path for them. So you want to understand that, maybe give them opportunity to share with the team how they've won a deal, like get their name in lights in other ways so that they continue to stay inspired and invigorated. I don't think there's just promotions where you can have people feel like they're really accomplishing a lot in their roles. So I think there's definitely ways for you to highlight your rock stars. Um, your middle of the pack, I think, is 
more um, you know development plan oriented. Uh, where are they at today? Where are they going? And put a you know three six month like maybe a six month plan with a milestone in you know three month milestone in between to say hey listen you're performing here on these expectations. I know you want to be a field rep or you want to be a senior um, account executive whatever it is. Here's what we need to work towards to do that. So let's you and I come up with a plan on how you can reach that. So I think development plans are an excellent way to take people that are at one level and you want to get them to another level. And that's a really clear way that you can do that. Now, when I was talking earlier about performance management, one thing I found my newer managers n really nervous about doing is having their first difficult conversation with a rep. They might be friends with that rep. It might be a rep that it was at one time performing, but now for another reason isn't. They could have worked with them for a long time. Maybe this manager was their peer, and then the manager gets promoted to be their boss, and now suddenly they've got to have this really uncomfortable um, conversation. You know, I would say if you're a manager and you, I'd be shocked for managers that are completely have no issue having these conversations with with other people. I still don't like having them. I'll have it, but I don't look forward to it. You know, that is not the highlight of my day. I know I've got to do it and I just want to get it over with, but I don't love doing it. Um, it's part of the job, but not not the part that I really enjoy. But I also know that, and I, this is what I teach my team and my new managers is, if you are not handling, let me tell you, you are not the only one who sees that that rep is not good. Everybody else does too. And if you're the manager who's not taking care of those issues, then your team is losing respect for you and they're getting frustrated. And your top performers are starting to feel resentful because they're performing, they're working hard. If you've got you know, some people who aren't performing, that means everyone else has to carry their weight. And that just creates some disengagement right? You want to keep your team engaged. And the team needs to know the expectations are fair for everyone and everyone's going to be held accountable. So our job is to hold people accountable. And sometimes that does mean you're going to have to have, uh, you know, a bit more of a, of a difficult conversation. Yeah. The, um, I remember the, I still remember the first person that I fired and the amount of sleep that I lost over it. And the sort of reflecting on it afterwards, my recognition that, you know, I, I was largely responsible because I wasn't able to give them the feedback that they needed early enough in the process so they could have self-corrected. That, yes, that is, yeah, it, it, it is on us. And I have seen that even with people that are more senior in their career, not want to have the tough conversation. Right. So if you look at kind of the, the profiles, which is the pitfalls you can fall into as a boss, this is what people end up happening. You end up going native. What, that, what I mean by that is you end up becoming, in that instance, the buddy, right? You don't, you don't want to, you're friends with them. You empathize with them a lot. Oh, I know, like this is not fair. Or you know that person is not performing well, but you're friends with them and you really don't want to have the tough conversation. But that is not how you help that person, right? The buddy is dangerous because then that person's going to perform worse and worse to the point where you do have to terminate them. And there's just no correcting it at that point. Right. I think that's kind of what you're talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't even know if I was, you know, you, you're probably right. Um, and maybe I didn't want, I don't want to admit it, but you know, I was, we had a great working relationship. Um, I don't think I had the skill to manage the or to understand, okay, these are the gaps and this is how we manage to that. And I certainly wasn't having the development conversations um, with the individual to say, okay, this is, this is what you're doing. This is where we need you to get to. Right. And so you're right. It's, it was, it's mostly on, it's almost entirely on me and not on the individual. And it's unfortunate anytime you have to sh sort of shuffle um, somebody out of organization, they're taking, you know, it's months of lost productivity for yourself. It's months or years potentially of lost career development for the individual. Yeah. No, so I, how do I, we I, make sure that, yeah, I was just gonna say, how do we make sure future versions of myself don't, uh, you know, make these problems and or make these same mistakes? Yeah, so that's a, gr a great segue. I think what you're saying is basically, um, you know, when when do you draw the line on cutting your losses? So first, yes, you have to be doing those coaching conversations in the one-on-ones. Um, 
certainly, and you have to identify. I mean, the, the issues could fall into a knowledge, quality, or skills bucket, and it could be qualities that you end up having to potentially terminate somebody on. Um, you, you've got to kind of watch all of those things. So what we typically, what I recommend my team do is first of all, you want to engage HR early, especially assuming if you're a company large enough to have HR. But the process that we follow is, you know, we'll basically give if, you know, I'll, if, like let's say something happens once, um, I'm not going to probably formulate, form, formally document it yet. I might have, a, I'll probably have a conversation around it. And depending how cute it is, I might have it immediately after something happens, or I might be able to wait to the next one-on-one. It really just depends on how egregious the, the coaching scenario is. Now, if I start to see a pattern, let's say something happens two and definitely by three times, I'm probably going to give them what I would call a verbal warning where I'm going to have the conversation. I'm going to, uh, you know, here's why this is impactful. This is why this is not good for the business. Um, I really want to work with you on a path to, um, you know, correct this or not have this happen. So let's think of like, what are three ways that we can focus on whatever it is, building more pipeline or whatever the, whatever the issue is. And then what I would do is I would follow that up with an email. The larger you get as a company, the harder it becomes to terminate someone because the more conservative your lawyers and your HR will become, at least that's in my experience. So the first thing I would do is, you know, it happens once, maybe twice, you have conversations around it, say, listen, we really, you know, this is, this is why this isn't good. But then once it's a developed pattern, I want to document it at least in an email. And if that doesn't work, or if something is very, something that I cannot have happen again, like absolutely not, like, let's say a rep gets a form signed or signs one themselves and something gets action based on that. And that was, they cannot do that. Like they basically went around a process and signed something that wasn't supposed to be signed like that. I can't have happen again. Then I'd go more the written warning route, which I would draft with HR and have legal take a look at it. That basically states, um, here's our expectations. Um, you, you basically, if you do this, th this thing again, um, you know, action will be taken up to and including your termination. But this is very like incident specific. This is not a performance improvement plan. This is something that is acute that happens that you absolutely cannot have happen again. And you need to be able to terminate them if it does. So that's kind of the written warning route. And then the performance improvement route is, um, you know, I tell you, of all the performance improvement plans I've done over my career, I would say 50% of the people uh, made the plan and 50% didn't. So I think you want to put people on plans if you think that there's a chance of, uh, certainly of, of a chance of correcting it. I know a lot of the times we'll have conversations with people of like, listen, like we've been talking about this. We've been trying to correct, you know, this, you, you, you've, you've been at, you know, 60% attainment for X amount of quarters. We've been trying to work on, we've done all these things. We're like, we're at, we're at the point now where we have two choices. You know, I'll put you on a performance plan and I'll work with you on that and I will support you and we will try to get this thing back on track. But I think, I think you need to think long and hard if this is the right position for you because we're going down one, either, either this isn't the right job and you decide on your own or we're going on, down the path of a performance improvement plan. Like at this point, that's where, that's where we're at. Those are our two choices. And a lot of the times the reps will know and we've been trying to work with them and it's not working out and they'll opt to leave. And sometimes they'll take the plan. And like I said, in 50% of my experience, I've had people actually make the plan. So, but that all, like definitely the written and the PIP need to be uh, done through HR. And it's much easier to put someone on a formal PIP with HR if you already have verbal warnings that are documented. Because the first thing HR will ask you, what is documented? What conversations have you had so far? And where's your proof of those conversations before they'll let you put them on a formal PIP? At least once you're big enough. I think if maybe you're a small company, it's not so formal, but certainly as you get uh, uh, certainly a public company or at least on the larger size, um, you do need to make sure you're, you're following that formal process. And th these can be really tough questions or sorry, tough conversations to have. What's, what's your been, what has your experience been with how people respond to, to these? Cause I could see, I could totally see getting somebody getting a pep and they're like, you know what? I'm done. I'm out. Um, or I could see them going the other direction and getting mad and being, you know, um, unhappy about it. 
um, and saying, oh, this isn't fair. This is like, what are the, the reactions and how do you sort of teach your managers to sort of deal with that process? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, the reactions definitely vary, but if you have done a good job of having repeated difficult conversations in increments, then this conversation should not be a surprise. I think when people react very poorly to this, it's when it's a surprise and they feel that this isn't warranted. Nobody told me this was going wrong. wrong. Um, I had no idea that I wasn't doing this right. That's when people start to respond very negatively um, when it's very, very surprising because you can kind of, you know, they're going to, they're going to respond in, in one of these typical ways, right? shock, anger, resistance, or acceptance, they're probably not going to jump right into acceptance <laughs> right out of the gate. <laughs> um, no one yeah. loves to have their job threatened. They're probably going to go through some phase of this. What I would say is the better job we do as managers on the front end of these discussions, the further along this arc we push it, right? This is They're going to get really angry if they're really shocked. So if you can take the shock out by managing this over time, that's going to maybe, they might still be angry. They might still resist and say, uh, hey, this is just how I am. I don't agree with you. Like they might still say these things, but after they've cooler heads prevail and they've had a time to think about it, um, usually you can get them to the point of like, well, I'm giving you a choice, but here, here, you know, we've been talking about this for the last two months. It's not gotten better. Um, I'm here to support you if you want to go down this path, but we are here at a fork in the road. And so I'm going to put the ball in your court as to how you want to proceed. So I think, yes, they're going to respond in one of these ways. And right, right, I don't understand. This is just one data point. This can't be right. You're going to hear all of that if this is the first time they're hearing about anything. Right? So the more you could do a better job of incrementally demonstrating what they're doing and how it's negatively impacting the team or the business. The more context we provide as managers, the easier it's, it's kind of like you can wait and have this conversation all at once, but it could go nuclear or it's a little more, it's like slowly pulling off a bandaid, but at least it's not going to be soup. It's not going to bleed. Right. It might be, Mm -hmm. more painful over a longer time, but you're not going to rip the skin off. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's more gradual, but not as dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. And I, I think there's a couple, there's a couple pieces. Like I love the, it, this is, it's funny. I've, I've, been, I've worked in big companies and small companies. And I, when I was working in a big company, I didn't really understand the value of the process. And then working in a small company um, in this, in a company of a few people, you know, the process process like that doesn't make sense. Now that we're up, up to about 50 people, and I've seen this in our organization, I've seen it in others, that, you know, when you add new people into an existing culture, they're not, they're still trying to figure things out. And I've seen people that are doing a great job in the first 90 days that are thinking, am I going to make it, right? Am I going to make it past probation? Um, and and I think that's a failing of, of the company because, you know, if you're a great person, you shouldn't be worried about that. If you've, if you've been here for six months or a year and your manager has a tough conversation with you, you shouldn't be worried. Oh, is so-and-so going to, you know, let me go. And I think one of the, one of the values or one of the, yeah, the, the pieces that this, that documenting this process and making it public and making it known to everybody, I think the part of it that it adds to your organization is that people are aware of it. And so they know, is this just feedback or is this that conversation? And like you said, the, the sooner in the process that you can start having these conversations, the less likely it is to go nuclear when you just nothing, 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 surprise, you're fired right at the end. Yeah, no, absolutely. And on that vein, um, you know, that's a great point. And this is kind of the guidance we give our team on corrective feedback so that they don't feel that, oh my gosh, like, you know, actually we still have people that will get very upset anytime anything is said that's wrong. Um, you might not be able to get around that and that's not you. It just could be how people are. Um, but what we coach people to do is say, listen, like the foundations of this are, you know, base it on direct observations. Don't go try to, you know, give somebody feedback by based on hearsay or things you haven't directly seen. I'll get, so, for example, if I hear, 
something is going on with a certain manager, but I haven't directly seen it. I will try to put myself in a situation where I can observe what's which, what's happening, and then I can I can take action on it. But I I don't try to take action on hearsay unless obviously this is you know if it's something that's definitely an HR issue or something like that. You've got to have people involved. Um, you know, HR, if it's some kind of harassment or something like that. I, I'm saying more of like performance related problems, not like legitimate HR problems. Those go directly to HR. Um, you also want to make it timely. So let's say that you observe something that happens. Like I've been on sales calls before and not been happy with how it's gone. Now, if I wait, you know, two weeks to talk to that rep, and say, hey, you remember that meeting we had like two weeks ago? And this is how it went down. And, I, you know, that's not really what I expected. I really expected you to do this. That person probably barely remembers it because they've probably had like 15 other meetings since then. So I really try within the first, within, you know, you don't want to give feedback. You know, one of my old bosses used to say, like, do the five block rule. Like, don't talk about a meeting or give anyone feedback until you're five blocks away from the appointment, just in case a competitor or the customer is walking around. <laughs> um, so <laughs> get, a, get away from the customer site. But you do want to be timely about it because it's relevant. You've just experienced it and you want to be private about it. Um, you, you definitely don't want to be give corrective feedback where other people can overhear. That's very embarrassing and it makes people feel threatened and that definitely is not going to increase your engagement. Um, and then have them participate in ways that, that it could go better. The, again, it kind of goes to coaching as opposed to, to telling, hey, well, what are your thoughts? Like, how do you think we could do better on this next time? And then let's let's just make it specific and actionable. So the next time we go to a meeting or the next time we do X, Y, or Z, let's check back in on how we're doing, right? So this kind of gives gives the rep a framework and the manager a framework on how to provide that feedback. So even if it's just one time, you're not, the rep hopefully doesn't feel as if they're at risk of losing their job. Great. Um, in, in so critical, um, I just finished reading a book called nonviolent communication. And if you're, so if you're struggling with how do I, how do I, when I'm sitting down with somebody, how do I make sure that I'm, I'm not, like I'm a very, I'd be a very blunt and straightforward person. Um, and I recognize that sometimes people are not happy with that communication style, especially when they're giving feedback, right? I can't, I, somebody could sit me down and be like, Hey, you suck at this. And here's why I think you suck. This is what you need to do to fix it. And I'd be like, sweet. I'm happy. Thank you for the feedback. Let's move on. Um, if I were to sit down with one of somebody who I who directly reports to me, they're not going to enjoy that style of feedback. Um, and so I found the book nonviolent communication, very, very helpful for breaking it down into, you know, uh, I'm, I won't try and remember the whole framework cause I'm going to miss pieces. Um, but if you're, if you're somebody that struggles, um, or is struggling to imagine yourself having one of these conversations, um, that might be a helpful book. Jamie, I really appreciate the, the sort of walkthrough of how you run like of what performance management looks like of how you gauge org health why people are why people are um, important um the i do want to leave a little time because i'm super curious about medpec and, and all that but before we transition is there anything that we've anything i've missed um that you think hey this is a critical piece to um, either managing or gauging org, org health um, I mean, I think we hit on all the important um, topics. I mean, there's, I mean, the, obviously this is a big, it's a big topic. There's a lot to it. I'm hope, hopefully I've given you guys some um, pointers into how we've invested in it in our company. And um, I think has positively impacted our performance and engagement, but yeah, no, I, th I think we covered all the important highlights. Perfect. I know we got some, um, there's a few, there are some people hanging out. So if you've got questions now, here's your time. Start throwing those into the chat. Jamie and I are going to go through just a recap of medic or med pick. Sorry. We, we dropped the P cause our deal size is, is small enough, um, where the P didn't make sense. So I I'm used to saying medic, but I know yours is medic or med pick. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you got questions for Jamie on anything we've covered today, now's the chance for those in the chat. Um, and with that said, Jamie, let's talk med pick. So two years ago, um, or I think about a year and a half ago, we had you on the show and you were forecasting, I think the relative revenue was around a half billion dollars a year. Um, and you were forecasting within 1%. I wanted to, I'm curious, um, how is, how has that gone since then? Cause I believe it was a fairly new program at the time. Yeah. So we, um, Zendesk was using, 
uh, a different methodology, uh, Franklin Covey, when I came on board. But it it just, in my opinion, didn't capture enough of where a deal could go wrong. And I just didn't think that, and because of that, it was really hard for me to forecast accurately. So once we implemented it, um, it became very easy to see where deals were. And I, and I knew that my team and I were speaking the same language. Like I knew what stage three meant. I knew that do nothing was still on the table. I knew do nothing was off the table for stage four. But if at stage four and it's in best case, I also knew we probably didn't have any red lines yet, which is why I do have a P in MedPick because you know, if you guys, anyone out there who's a SaaS company, you probably are like me and have an SO, a PO, an MSA, a DPA, a uh, BAA, SOW, all of which have different legal terms associated to them. So we definitely have to have the paper process in there. But we got a lot better and we were still, I was still forecasting within, um, you know, within 5%, um, not always 1%. I mean, we had, we had some good quarters in there. Um, and, and my, you know, they don't complain if you go over. So, um, but usually, usually we would stick within 5%. The only times that um, you know, we, we don't, we know what happened was we started to hire a lot of people. We had different managers that had never been through the training. And when I did the program two years ago, enablement did not do it with me. I did go a little bit rogue and, you know, I, I was the only region who implemented it. And so I didn't have the support from anyone else to kind of create an ongoing program to support it. So I kind of lost some of the DNA and the discipline as we brought in new people, it became harder for us to train them. And then it just kind of got weaker and weaker over time. So we actually brought in force management in Q4 in October. I brought them back in. I did a full day with managers and half days with the half day with the reps as a refresher. And for a lot of people, it was the first time they'd actually been through it. So um, the reason for that is I started to watch my conversion rates start to go down again. My ASP was dropping a bit and my deals were slipping. And those are all symptoms of having a bad, you know, sales process that's not tight. So because of that, I used uh, a chunk of my budget to bring them back in. And we have started to reverse those trends um, that we were seeing because now the whole team as, you know, they became a bunch of new people came in. Um, and enablement did it with me this time, and it became a global rollout. So they, my enablement team did the train the trainer. So now whenever I bring in new people, um, there is full training on MedPick. We also did value negotiation. If you guys have not done that, um, I'm just going to put a quick plug in. My average discounting on mid-sized deals was about 15%. It dropped to 5% within a couple of weeks of deploying the training. So that was wow. highly, highly valuable. The value negotiation training completely changed how my team looks at um, negotiating. They start from the get go, you know, a lot of, you know, listening for anchors, setting their own anchors. So that, that those two complementing each other. And now that enablement um, is trained on those, I think the key is you've got to have a way of, if you do train your teams on any of these things, if you don't have a way of ongoing refreshers um, and you don't have a way to train your new hires, it's going to, just disappear over time. Um, another really interesting thing we've done is now whenever I do competitive training, I do it in the value negotiation framework. One of the concepts from, from the negotiation training is something called life with the alternative. What that means is you really have to recognize for the customer what is going to be better for them if they go with the alternative and what's going to be worse. And you need to be able to articulate that, right? So if I'm competing against Salesforce, I might say, well, you know, if you go with Salesforce, you know, per, you know, eighty percent, you you can customize eighty percent of what they do. Um, it's also going to probably take you six months or longer to do that, and you have a product launch in two months, right? So with Zendesk, sure, maybe we're eighty percent out of the box, twenty percent customization, but we can get you up and running in six weeks, which is going to make your product timeline. So you really have to decide what's going to be more important to you, um, you know, in terms of getting this deployment. So 
we had the, the enablement team help draft our competitive training in the life with the alternative framework. Because what it did is it instilled that lesson and that framework with the team at the same time as educating them on the competition. So that's kind of another sneaky way to continue to train people on your concepts is to figure out what else you need to train them on and can you fit it into one of your frameworks. Fantastic. And so just before we move on to life of, uh, from value negotiation um, and the life with the alternative, this was these are force management courses. Are there any books or any online resources that people would be able to check out? Um, uh, so for value negotiation, there is, yes, there is a book. Oh, my gosh. You know what? I'm going to have to get back to you on that. I'm blanking on the name of it. But there is a book that basically they took a lot of the concepts from. But it's an old book, and it's not digital because I tried to buy it that way. Um, can I have that as one of my follow-up items that I'll I'll share? Absolutely. Um, we've been, and I totally appreciate that. We've been going for almost ninety minutes now, and you and I were on for half an hour before this. So I think this is a great place to to end it. I don't see. Oh, I see Cheryl's got a. Looks like she's trying to get a question, and so I'll, I'll pause for one second. If we got questions now, now is the time. Otherwise, we're gonna gonna let Jamie. Oh, outstanding session. Right on, Jamie. Uh, Cheryl is asking value negotiation, Horatio? Horatio? No, it's not that. It's not, the book is not called value negotiation. That's the training. Um, the okay. book, I, the book might be called getting, it might be getting to yes. I got to see if that's the book or not though. It may or may not be. Um, I know I've purchased it and it's sitting on, I know where it is at my house, but I'm blinking. I just did not think about that today because I wasn't thinking about value no negotiation. Problem. I just kind of riffed on that a little bit. <laughs> That's fair. Jamie, thank you so much for coming on the show and doing this live with us and, and being and open to the, all the questions. I really appreciate it. Tons of value. Um, and there's, it, it's so clear that there's, I'm, I'm really excited and impressed by the fact that Zendesk is doing so much to, you know, invest in their leaders, in their future leaders. Um, I can't thank you enough. It's given me such clarity into my role as CEO, as a sales leader. Um, and it's certainly, I think we're going to have, um, it's certainly a topic that we need a lot more focus on. So it's, there's going to be many more of these types of episodes that are coming down the, the pipeline. So thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. And thank you for the great audience. Right on. If anybody's looking to get in touch, what's the, what's the best way? Um, definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. So feel free to do that. And then I think you'll get access. I think if you do that, you get my personal email. And then I'm JF Bus um, at JF Bus on Twitter as well. Correct. I'll just throw a link to your LinkedIn profile in the chat there. And one last thanks to everybody for listening. We'll see you all next week. And one last thanks for Jamie. This was such a great episode. Thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you.